The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the whistler. I am the whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for The Whistler. Rated by independent research, the most popular West Coast program in the history of radio. And now The Whistler's strange story. The Lady... And the knife. It was only three in the afternoon, but the hotel cocktail lounge near the railroad depot in Omaha was buzzing with customers caught there between trains. In the darkness of a corner booth, Morley Carr sat with a portly gentleman in the salt and pepper suit. His name was Sam Ryan, and he loved to talk. Morley, on the other hand, loved to listen. Yes. In his kind of business, he often found it profitable to strike up an acquaintanceship with an overindulgent stranger in a bar. And the minute he saw the man in the salt and pepper suit, Morley smelled money. China? <laughs> Do I know China? <laughs> Listen, mister, I know China like the palm of my hand, from Beijing to Hong Kong. Ah, spent a lot of time there, Sam? Six years. <laughs> Been fired off of every English-speaking newspaper in the Orient. <laughs> yeah, gentlemen, pair it tall ones. Ah, great. Tell them to get working on two more. Uh, that'll be a dollar twenty. Oh, here, let me get this. Oh, no, 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 this is my party. Here you are, waiter. Keep the chain. Oh, thank you, sir. Oh, you shouldn't have done that, Sam. It was my round. Oh, forget it. <laughs> I like you, pal. I like the way you talk. I like the way you wear clothes. <laughs> <laughs> if I had the crust, I'd offer to buy that overcoat you got on. <laughs> yeah, where'd you get it? Got it in London. <laughs> I thought so. I could pick that check out of Times Square in the rush hour. Well... Uh, tell me, uh, what are your plans from now on, Sam? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what are your plans now, oh, Sam? Oh. Retire. Retire? Oh, well, that takes money. Mm, yeah, I got it. Right here in my pocket. Yeah? <laughs> Funny, isn't it? I beat my brains out for 20 years in the newspaper business and never made a dime. Then bingo, my card comes up. <laughs> and old Sam has the key to a quarter million bucks in his pocket. A quarter million? <laughs> sure. <laughs> it's just like the song. Uh, let me see. How does it go? Uh, I'm always chasing rainbows. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Watching <laughs> clouds drifting. I, I, uh, I don't feel so hot, pal. Oh, you're okay, Sam. I, uh, my schemes are just... I, oh, my head, I... Ah, that's that. Um, waiter. Uh, yes, sir. Help me get Mr. Ryan upstairs to his room. Looks like the party's over. It sounds a little fantastic, doesn't it, Morley? But it's worth looking into. A quarter of a million dollars, he said and something about the key to it in his pocket. The waiter helps you carry him to his room, lay him on the bed, and you walk down the hall a few doors to your own room, already thinking of the approach you're going to use on your newfound friend, Sam, when he comes around tomorrow. Ten minutes later, you hear a noise down the hall that brings you to your door. You open it quietly. That noise sounded like it was from Sam's room. Oh, oh it was. A 
A girl leaves Sam's room, passes close to you as she hurries down the hall. You get a good look at her. Black hair, a pretty face, but hard. As soon as she turns the corner, you run down the hall. Sam's door is still unlocked. <gasps> He's still on the bed, Morley, right where you left him. But now there's a knife in his back. A second later, you see the reason. His inside coat pocket, the one he patted when he talked about the key to the quarter million, is empty. Oh, uh, Dorman. Yes, sir? I'm looking for a young lady, uh, black hair, in a fur jacket. Did you see her leave? Why, yes, sir. She got into a taxi only a minute ago. Taxi? Huh? Which one? Do you know the driver? I don't know his name, but this is a regular station. He ought to be back in a few minutes. Oh, thanks. See, uh, black haired dame in a fur jacket. That's right. You know, it's awful hard to remember sometimes. Uh, here, maybe this will help. Well, thanks. Yeah, yeah, as a matter of fact, I do remember her now. Took her to a hotel on the other side of town, picked up her baggage, and uh, then brought her back to the station. She got on the 706 for San Francisco, pulled out about a half hour ago. You got a good memory. I'll be back in five minutes. Wait here for me. Right. Where to? The airport. With the prologue of The Lady and the Knife, bringing you another strange story by The Whistler. And now back to The Whistler. If there were any doubts in your mind about the key to the quarter million Sam Ryan was prattling about, they're gone now. His body lying on the bed in that Omaha hotel. That empty pocket in his coat, and above all, the lady with the knife, all tell you that it's real. That if you play it smart, part of that quarter million is yours. That's why you're standing in the terminal in San Francisco now as the passengers from the 706 from Omaha come down the ramp. A minute later, you see her. Follow her to a cab and hear her direct the driver to a hotel on Eddy Street. Yes, sir. Uh, pardon me, I heard a friend of mine was registered here. Name's Bradley. Bradley? Right. Mm. Here, I'll check the register. Oh, don't bother. I'll look. Uh, let's see now. Smith. Anderson. Oh. Mm. Well, I, I guess he's not here. Thanks. Not at all. Lucia Lacey, room 402. The last name on the register, Lucille Lacey. The lady and the knife. Directly across the street, there's another hotel. A small one, a little ragged at the edges. You get a room at the front of the building where you can keep an eye on the entrance of the Brighton across the street. And during the next few days, you follow Lucille Lacey everywhere. But it's not until the fourth day that she makes a move that means something. A pawn shop on 3rd Street, run by a man you know, a man named Cardoza. You wait in a store entrance until you see her leave, then walk across for a word with him. A furtive, cautious man with a nervous habit of doodling on a scratch pad as he talks to you across the counter. Little bit like old times, Morley, having you back in town. Just passing through, Cardoza. How, uh, how's business been? Mm, I'm getting by. Just getting by? <laughs> That's all. You are looking up all your old friends? Oh, no, I'm here on business. Mm. Big? Yeah. Uh, when? Oh, I don't know yet. Can you take care of me? Maybe I ought to know more about it. Maybe I'll leave it there <laughs> for the time being. Well, so long, Cardoza. 
Don't take any wooden diamonds. Well, Morley, you know a great deal more than you did before. Cardoza's main stock in trade is jewelry. And this time, it's $175,000 worth. At least, that was the figure Cardoza was doodling on his scratch pad. It's the biggest thing you've ever run across. You're really careful with Miss Lacey now. Watch her like a hawk. And the next day, you follow her to a shabby office south of Market Street. You watch the entrance until she comes out. And then hurry across the street and up a flight of stairs. Faded gilt lettering on a frosted glass door tells you who Lucille was calling on this time. Zach Chambers, private investigator. Looking for somebody, mister? I'd like to talk to Mr. Chambers. The boss? He isn't in just now. Oh? If you want to leave your name... Oh, I'll... no, no, it's all right. Um, I was supposed to meet a young lady here, a Miss Lacey. If she comes in... Lacey? We'll... Oh, yeah, she was just in, coming back at 3 o'clock. Oh, you think Chambers will be back before then? Mm, he better. I haven't been to lunch yet. I see. Say, look, if you don't mind, I'd like to wait. I haven't anything else to do. Go ahead. Find a chair in his office. Well, thanks. There's some magazines on the desk. Kind of tired ones. But if you haven't already seen them... <laughs> I'll make out. I'm sure you will, handsome. Oh, uh, Mr. Chambers? That's right. My secretary tells me you've been waiting a couple of hours. Uh-huh. I was beginning to think you might not get back in time. For what? We've got about 20 minutes, Mr. Chambers. I'll get right to the point. I want you to do me a favor. No, I'm not exactly in the habit Well, there'll of... be a fee in it for you, of course. A good one. Yeah? You've uh, got an appointment with a girl at 3 o'clock. I have? Yes, your secretary told me. She talks too much. Oh, that's all right. I I've been following this girl for some time. Now. Well... Oh, no, no, no. It's nothing like that. See, I'm a friend of her husband's. She ran out on him. It happens every day. Why don't you stay out of it? No, no, this is different. She really loves the guy. She's just, well, mixed up. Yeah, aren't they all? I promised him I'd talk to her. Well, so far, I haven't found the opportunity. Doesn't she know you? No, no, that's what gave me the idea. You're way ahead of me, pal. I'd, uh, I'd like to take your place, Mr. Chambers. Huh? When she comes here to talk to you. Oh, now, wait well, a minute. Well, there's nothing really wrong. You know how people pour their hearts out to strangers. Well, I figured it'd give, be a perfect chance to talk her into going back. Just friendly advice from a disinterested party. Ah. Uh -huh. Well, what do you say? Well, I can uh, see your point, and it seems like a neat way to get to her. What was it you said about money? What's your usual fee? Twenty a day in expenses, only, uh... This is a rather unusual case. Shall we make it 50? Yeah. Let's. What do I do? Where's your secretary? Out to lunch. All right. Keep her out. And stay away yourself for a couple of hours. Oh, uh, where can I hang my coat? That closet in the corner. Ah. Oh. Mm, 50 bucks for doing nothing. That's not bad. Of course, uh, there isn't a chance I won't get... You come back at five. I'll give you your money then. That is, if she keeps the appointment. Okay, pal. Oh, um, one more thing. Yeah? You're a very interesting liar. You sit behind Zach Chambers' desk, thumbing a magazine and waiting. And then, just before three o'clock... Uh, I'm Miss Lacey, your secretary. Oh, I know, Miss Lacey. I've been expecting you. Uh, have a chair. Thank you. Like a cigarette? No, thank you. Mr. Chambers, I'm worried. I don't know exactly how to explain well, it. Well, the first thing to do is relax, Miss Lacey. Certainly nothing can happen to you here. I'm not so sure. There's someone following me, Mr. Chambers. A man. He's been following me for days. Oh, any idea why? Not the slightest. You know, of course, Miss Lacey, for me to be of any real help, you will have to take me into your confidence. I'm telling you all I know. Ah. Did you get a close look at him? No. He's been too careful. But he's tall. Spot your bill. Where's a checked overcoat? Mm-hmm. Well, that should help. Uh, just what do you want me to do? If... If you could find out his name, where he's staying. That's all you want? That's all. 
Okay, I'll see what I can find out, Miss Lacey. Where can I reach you? I'm staying at the Brighton. Check. Do you suppose you could have something on this by tonight? Possibly. Will you be in? All evening. Oh, uh, how much will you want? Oh, yes. <laughs> the fee. Well, I usually get uh, 20 a day in expenses, but uh, you're asking me to work pretty fast. I'm aware of that. Okay, Miss Lacey. Let's say uh, $50, huh? That ought to cover everything. Twenty, thirty, forty, fifty bucks. Okay, pal, all here. How'd you make out? Oh, well, we had a nice talk. It's like I told you, she's just a confused girl. Oh, sure. Well, I'll be running along. Thanks for the cooperation. Thanks for the fee. Hey, uh, wait a minute. You forgot your overcoat. Oh, yeah. Say, you like that coat, Zach? Yeah, it's a knockout. All right, it's yours. Huh? <laughs> the lady, she doesn't like it on me. But, Mr. Chambers, you're sure it was the right man? How could I miss with that checked overcoat? Well, anyway, I didn't have to look very far. He came up to my office right after you left. He followed me there? That's right. Who is he? He's a pretty big guy, Miss Lacey. Name's Morley Carr. Ever hear of him? Morley Carr. No. Uh, how do you mean he's big? Oh, international jewel thief. Anything that comes along that has money in it, big money. I see. You know, I, I'm beginning to think that $50 deal I made with you is too cheap. You may need some help, Miss Lacey. I'm not asking for help. Uh, what's he after? And I'm not paying you to ask questions. Now, look, lady, after all, I'm on your side, remember? What did he want? He tried to sound me out about you, or rather tried to buy me out. He uh, offered me a deal. Where does that leave us? Well, I figured I'd talk to you first. Of course, he's coming back. I'll have to tell him something. You can tell him you're not for sale. Oh, oh, but I am. You don't have to tell me how big this is with car in it. I know it's big. Too big for anyone to handle alone. You might as well admit that to yourself right now. Maybe you're right. Yeah. Have we got a deal? Well, something has to be done about Carr. Why don't you leave that to me? No. Oh, just give me some time. I've got to think. When's he coming back? Tomorrow night. When's he? It's got to go one way or the other before Thursday morning. Why? Never mind why. I think you'd better go now. I'll get in touch with you. Okay. Oh, mind if I take this paper along? I haven't read it. I'm through with it. Okay, thanks. <laughs> well, so long, boss. You're playing it close, Morley. But you're in the home stretch now. The newspaper from Lucille's room, folded open at the page covering steamship arrivals, with a check mark opposite the entry, SS President Grant, Pier 37, Thursday AM. It's important to stay close to Lucille now. And there's a way to do that, isn't there, Morley? It's brazen, but it's sure. Early Thursday morning, you call her. Miss Lacey? Yes? Zach Chambers. What do you want? I just called to tell you not to think too hard. I, uh, took care of the man in the checked overcoat. You what? Just that. So don't worry about him anymore. What did you... Hello? And that's what Gertrude said, Hello. Julie. Hello? That's perfectly silly, Donald. I didn't say any such thing. What's I... wrong? Operator, I was talking I... to... I'm sorry, sir. I'll reconnect you. Hello? Hello, Mr. Chambers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody cut in on us. Did you hear what I was saying about... will you? Not on the telephone. Oh, but who's going to know I that? said never mind. I want you to come over here right away. Sure thing, boss. That's all I wanted to hear. You shouldn't have been so careless on the telephone, Mr. Chambers. Why not? Who'd have any idea what I meant? I might have been talking about a fuller brush man. But you weren't. Oh, let's forget it. Well, going somewhere... Why? Oh, the bag's all packed. I just decided to move, that's all. Oh. Checked out yet? Not till morning. Mm-hmm. What about our deal? You decided anything? I... Uh, I guess you're right. Too much for me to handle alone. Ah, you're smart. Gonna let your hair down? Take a look in that desk drawer. 
Something you ought to see. Okay. And you see it the minute you open the drawer. Sam Ryan's wallet. And on top of it, a baggage claim check stamped SS President Grant. You smile. Glance up at the mirror over the desk. Just in time to see her raise her arm behind you, a knife in her hand. Oh, no, you don't. Go of me, you let go. Not a chance, you little... Always a knife with you, isn't it, baby? Always a knife! (gasps) For a minute, you stand there trembling, staring at the knife on the floor where you dropped it. Then you slowly walk over to the desk, pick up Sam's wallet and the baggage check. SS President Grant, B-10238. You have it now, Morley. The key to the whole thing. A baggage check marked with a number in the name of a ship. One more thing now as you let yourself out of Lucille's room. You hang a sign on the doorknob. Do not disturb. Fifteen minutes later, you're waiting at the baggage window at Pier 37. The clerk looks at the baggage claim check, walks slowly past a row of bins, finally settles on a small black box. There you are, sir. Just came in on the grant. One portable typewriter. A type typewriter? It's yours, isn't it? Oh, let me look at that check again. B10238. Yeah, yeah, that's that's right. Thanks very much. Seabrook Hotel. That's on uh, Eddy Street, ain't it? That's right, driver. You can't wait any longer, can you, Morley? As the taxi cab weaves through traffic, you open the portable typewriter on the floor where the driver can't see it. Oh, oh there's nothing here. Oh, wait a minute. You get out your pocket knife, poke at the lining of the case. The point of the knife suddenly finds a soft place. Ah, now here we are. The paper lining comes off, revealing a cotton pad underneath. You pluck it out, and the bottom of the box seems to burst into flame. Diamonds. Holy cow, what a payoff. The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. And now back to The Whistler. Well, it began with a hunch, didn't it, Morley? With a solid, sure feeling that the man in the salt and pepper suit back in that bar in Omaha had money. And it paid off on a dock in San Francisco when a baggage clerk put a fortune in smuggled diamonds into your hands. As the cab pulls up in front of your hotel, you know the important thing now is time, that you have to be out of town before Lucille Lacey's body is discovered in her hotel room across the street. The lobby is almost deserted when you enter. A tired-looking gentleman is reading the paper in a chair near the window. And the clerk, as usual, is wrapped up in his true detective magazine. 308, please. Hmm? Oh, yes. Oh, say, uh, get my bill ready. I'm checking out in ten minutes. Uh, just a minute. Uh, Brady? Yeah? This is the man, 308. Huh? Well, what Keep are you... Keep your hands on the counter. Take a look, buddy. Headquarters. Look, I don't know what this is all... This is the guy who made the call? He scared the operator out of her wits. I had to send her home. Operator? That telephone call you made a couple of hours ago. Got kind of gabby, didn't you? Something about taking care of the guy in the checked overcoat? Oh, oh that? Yeah, that. Why, it was only a gag, officer. I, I was kidding her, you see. You got a queer sense of humor. Zach Chambers was found in an alley this morning. What? With a knife in his back. Know anything about it? A knife? Say, now, what... he was wearing a checked overcoat. 
The papers hit the streets an hour ago. Now, listen, officer, I don't know anything about it. Well, when I called her, I was kidding, don't you see? Who were you kidding? A lady that brightened across the street, room 402, made a note of it right here in the register. Oh, now, listen, you got to let me explain. I had nothing to do with it. We'll I... get to that later. Later? Yeah. At the moment, I want to see how your girlfriend took the joke about the guy in the checked overcoat. Oh, now, wait a minute. You can't... Come on, mister. Let's go over and talk to the lady in 402. Let that whistle be your signal for the Whistler each Monday at 9. Featured in tonight's story were Joseph Kearns and Betty Lou Gerson. The Whistler was produced by George W. Allen with story by Joel Malone and Harold Swanton. Music by Wilbur Hatch and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking... This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.